Sphenopalatine ganglion block has been used for over a century for diagnosis and treatment of various forms of headache and facial pain. And although there are different techniques, accessing this parasympathetic ganglion using ultrasound is straightforward, and today it's widely performed in pain clinics, operating theaters, and emergency rooms around the world. In this video, we'll discuss the anatomy, sonoanatomy, and technique for blocking the sphenopalatine ganglion. To begin with, recognize there are two accepted names for this ganglion and for the fossa it lives in, the sphenopalatine and the pterygopalatine. Same thing. To keep it easy, we're going to stick with SPG. Okay, let's look at the bony anatomy. The sphenopalatine ganglia are a paired set of parasympathetic ganglia that live on either side of the face in the pterygopalatine fossa. If we start outside the skull and take away the zygoma, we see the infratemporal fossa. Let's get a closer look. We see the keyhole-shaped pterygopalatine fossa here. It's boxed in by three bones, the maxilla anteriorly, the palatine bone medially, and the sphenoid bone posteriorly. It's open on the lateral side, which we'll take advantage of for our block. Visible in this fossa are a number of nerves. The big chunky one running through the superior aspect is the maxillary nerve, the second branch of the trigeminal. There are two fine connections dropping down from this. These are the ganglionic nerves, and they allow crosstalk between the somatic maxillary nerve and the parasympathetic sphenopalatine ganglion seen here, dangling down from the maxillary nerve. Spoiler alert, we're going to drive our needle straight in, aiming for the lateral pterygoid plate about here, but more on that later. Now, the neuroanatomy of the SPG is complex and beyond the scope of this video, but here are the basics you need to know. The main function of the SPG is a relay station for preganglionic parasympathetic fibers that come from the facial nerve, cranial nerve 7. They run through the pterygoid canal to synapse at the SPG. Postganglionic fibers then hitchhike along the ophthalmic and maxillary divisions of the trigeminal nerve to provide secretomotor motor input to the lacrimal gland and the mucosa of the nose, mouth, and pharynx. The SPG has also been called the hay fever ganglion because stimulation makes your eyes water and your nose run. Now importantly, the SPG also sends branches to the meningeal and cerebral blood vessels. This last part is key to understanding the mechanism of SPG block for headache. Now, there are also sympathetic fibers in this region. They originate from the superior cervical ganglion in the neck, travel along the carotid artery, travel through the pterygoid canal, and zip right through the SPG without stopping. Kind of like a traffic roundabout. These provide sympathetic innervation to the nasal and pharyngeal mucosa and the lacrimal gland. And then just to round things out, somatic fibers of the palatine nerves carry sensory information from the palate, oral cavity, tonsils, and uvula through the SPG without stopping before joining up with the maxillary nerve. Fun fact, the ice cream headache or brain freeze after cold food or drink is mediated by the SPG. Can I have some rapivacaine with that Slurpee? The SPG block is performed primarily as a treatment for a group of headaches called trigeminal autonomic cephalalgias. Cluster headache is the most common type of these and is characterized by attacks of severe unilateral periorbital pain along with autonomic symptoms resulting from the parasympathetic overdrive. Tearing, injected conjunctiva, periorbital swelling, nasal congestion, ptosis, and meiosis. These symptoms are thought to be mediated by the trigeminal autonomic reflex where various triggers set off parasympathetic pathways in the brainstem that then flow through the SPG. Blocking the SPG halts that parasympathetic outflow to the face and relieves symptoms. But remember, the SPG also helps innervate the cerebral vasculature. Both migraine and postural puncture headache are thought to be mediated by dysregulated cerebral vasodilatation, and there's evidence that blocking the SPG works to vasoconstrict these intracerebral arteries and relieve the pain. With postural puncture headache, the loss of intracerebral CSF is compensated for by a swelling of the vasculature, per the Monroe Kelly Doctrine. You gotta fill up the skull somehow, and vasoconstriction by SPG block helps to reverse that phenomenon. Many centers are using SPG block as first-line treatment for PDPH rather than the traditional conservative therapy followed by yet another epidural to administer a blood patch. And finally, besides headache, there are data to support the use of SPG block for perioperative analgesia following cleft palate repair in children and for functional endoscopic sinus surgery. And because of the ease of administration, the list of these mid-face perioperative indications is likely to grow, so stay tuned. There's a whole laundry list of other conditions that SPG block has been used for, and it has had some good successes in a few of them, such as migraine, trigeminal neuralgia, or atypical facial pain. Some of these are a little hard to rationalize, and data is limited to case reports for many others. The best use case to date is for cluster headaches, postural puncture headache, and mid-phase surgery. Okay, so here's how to get the right picture. You'll see we've drawn out the margins of the zygoma and posterior aspect of the orbital rim. We're going to place a probe just inferior and parallel to the zygomatic arch with a slight cranial tilt. This will allow us to see between the coronoid process of the mandible here and the maxilla. There are two obvious bony structures, the coronoid process and the maxilla. 
The soft tissue space between is the infratemporal fossa, and at the bottom of that is a lateral pterygoid plate. The pterygopalatine fossa containing the SPG is deeper and hidden by the maxillary shadow, but that's okay. Once we have our image, we'll place our needle at a point just above the zygoma and posterior to the orbital rim and advance slowly into the infratemporal fossa until we get to about here. Note that the probe is tilted slightly cranially and the needle is directed slightly caudally. Imagine the beam and needle meeting at about 4 centimeters into the tissues. Another good directional landmark is to think about aiming the needle for the tragus of the contralateral ear. You'll see tissue motion as you advance deeper into the infratemporal fossa. Small squirts of saline can help you hydrolocate. Once you get to about 3 to 4 centimeters or just above the lateral pterygoid plate, aspirate and inject the local anesthetic. 5 mils is all that's required in an adult to flood the deep infratemporal fossa and soak the SPG. This is a very safe technique because of the angle of insertion. If you go far enough, you'll just hit the lateral pterygoid plate. It's nearly impossible to advance a needle through an unwanted foramen with this approach. In contrast, there are other descriptions that may not be quite as attractive. For example, an infrazygomatic in-plane approach from posterior travels through the portion of the infratemporal fossa that contains the facial nerve and all five branches of the maxillary artery. Here we see a big, chunky artery behind the ramus. Moving the probe in the anterior direction, we're back to our original fossa view with no discernible Doppler signal. The infrazygomatic approach also aims a needle right at the inferior orbital fissure, I'd prefer to stay out of the eyeball if it's all the same. Now, the maxillary artery and its branches do travel through this space, and although arterial puncture seems to be a rare finding with this approach, careful aspiration is prudent before injecting. It can be seen using Doppler, but this is not always the case. This is considered an intermediate risk procedure by ASRA, meaning that patients should have normal hemostasis before proceeding. We'll typically use 5 mils of half percent ropivacaine as our local anesthetic. While the drug effect only lasts for 12 to 15 hours, the relief of pain usually lasts longer, and in some cases, the headache is relieved for weeks. For postdural puncture headache, usually one treatment is curative. In the setting of persistent or recurring headache, successful treatment with an initial block often predicts success for SPG ablation or neuromodulation for long-term relief. In terms of side effects, slight bruising over the temporal area is not uncommon. Because a maxillary nerve is almost always blocked as well, it's good to warn the patient that he or she may experience temporary numbness of the upper teeth and mid-face. Occasionally, local anesthetic may travel through the foramen rotundum to reach the semilunar ganglion of the trigeminal nerve. This is, in fact, a desired outcome in some cases of facial pain. This will manifest as numbness in all three zones of the face, as well as some weakness chewing. Here are some SPG tips. First, a common alternative approach is to drip local anesthetic onto the posterior nasal mucosa in an effort to sneak in the back door to the pterygopalatine fossa. There is a communication there, the small sphenopalatine foramen, so maybe it makes sense. However, the data is not reassuring, and some have argued that it's just too far and too narrow of a distance to expect local anesthetic to travel to reach the SPG. We agree and advocate for the simple but ultimately effective ultrasound-guided technique. Second, we do recommend a small gauge needle in awake patients. A 25 gauge spinal needle is sufficient. It's a straight shot, so you don't need a stiff needle to joystick around. In anesthetized patients, we'll often use a 21 gauge blunt tip block needle just for the haptic feedback. And finally, while the lateral pterygoid plate is a good safety backstop, it's uncomfortable to hit it with a needle and not necessary. Just advance 3 to 4 centimeters into the faucet and let your local spread from there.